In our archive, we have wonderful material that kind of charts the diverse streams that have made up American Jewish life. Um, when the American Jewish Historical Society got started, there was a huge emphasis on showing um, how Jews had fought in the Revolutionary War, or Jews had fought in the Civil War, um, and showing how Jews had contributed to American political life, American economic life, um, because the people who founded AJHS in 1892 were very proud of their history, but they were also very nervous about prejudice that was rising in the late 19th century uh, against Jews, and they thought, if we can gather information that really tells the story, we'll be able to fight this prejudice and create a sense of pride for this people and uh, a sense of group identity. Um, and so a hundred and many years later, what's 1892 to, to today? I'm not good at math, I'm better at history. 127 years or 128 years. Um, but uh, speaking of history, when you're trained as a historian, the first book I read at Columbia was called That Noble Dream, The Pursuit of Objectivity, written by a great historian um, named Peter Novick. And it was all, it's all about kind of over the field of uh, history, the discipline of history, how you're supposed to strive to be objective, and you're supposed to treat history as a science. And of course, it's a lot more complicated than it, than it sounds. And I am here to admit and to say that as I curated this exhibit, I was not an objective <laughs> observer. In fact, it, it would be very hard to find someone who was immune to the charms of um, the Russ Fetterman Tupper family, um, and it would be hard to find someone who didn't like the food. So I am <laughs> very hard. And, and, and in fact, if that person didn't like the food, they wouldn't be objective either. So I, I, I figured this was an important exhibit for us to do. Um, a couple years ago, I guess it must have been 10 years ago, I was at the Tenement Museum um, with my colleague, Morris Vogel, who's here. And we created a little uh, gallery exhibit uh, with the wonderful photographer, Harvey Wang, who I believe is here. Where's Harvey? Harvey? Maybe he's talking outside. Um, so Harvey, in, in this exhibit, has a picture that you can actually see in this exhibit as well of Mark holding up a fish in the store. And I was able, I think that was the first time I met Mark or was able to talk to him. And he said to me, you know, you're a smart young woman. I have a daughter. She's a smart young woman. You guys should really be friends. <laughs> and it was the first time I had been set up on a friend kind of thing. <laughs> um, and I didn't get to, and then I think I got to meet Nikki, and over time we indeed became friends. Um, and I've been able to spend a lot of time with this family um, over the years. Um, and so when I came to AJHS, one of the things I saw, and actually I think I even have a picture of, these are our stacks. So this is, you get to see part of this. We're not going to go on a tour of the stacks, and I promise you I'm not going to talk about each and every one of the 30 million documents that you see. But I'm going to jump to the next slide. Here we go. Um, and so when Nikki came to visit, I showed her we have a, an amazing cookbook collection that is part of the stacks. And the cookbook collection is fascinating. There, that shows the kind of regional variations. There is no one single American Jewish life, right? So there is a cookbook called Mazel Tov Y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from New Orleans. Um, there's also Shalom on the Range from Denver. <sighs> there's Galilean Housewives. And there's also Esther Levy's uh, Book of Kosher Cookery or something. Uh, uh, Melanie, what's the name of it? Oh, Melanie's outside talking too. See, I, I, I'm never going to mention people. Um, so we have this wonderful cookbook collection. And I was saying to, and of course, we found in the cookbook collection a very important book, which is uh, called Russ and Daughters. <laughs> so we took a picture to send it to, to Mark. But um, what Nikki and I talked about was how important it would be for AJHS, American Jewish Historical Society, to not only collect Jewish cookbooks, but to collect the archives of the stores that have brought this Jewish food to life. Um, and so we talked about the Russ and Daughters archive, the collection of photographs, of documents, of tablecloths, and of all sorts of wonderful things coming to AJHS where we could preserve it, make it accessible to a public, make it accessible to scholars, and 
use it to create an exhibit. This was in April, I think, this picture was taken. And then we got the materials in June, and we had said, well, maybe we'll do an exhibit. That would be kind of fun. And then all of a sudden, we saw the material, and we said, we have to do an exhibit. So we created an exhibit in about three weeks. Um, and to create an exhibit in three weeks takes a lot of time. And I, there's a lot of people I need to thank. And I want to make sure I do that bef be before I forget. Um, I want to thank Shana Marchese. Is she here? Or is she? Can you stand up, Shana? <laughs> Shana designed. Shana designed the exhibit. She worked on it nonstop um, on her weekends, on her vacation, all the time. And she just did a beautiful job. And she's a wonderful person uh, to work with. So I wanted to thank Shana. Um, and I want to thank Shana's husband, Doug, too, <laughs> for sharing Shana with us. I want to thank um, Jen Snow. Please stand up. Yes, <laughs> Jen Snow is here. Most of you in this room know Jen Snow and how vital she is to the operations and to the story of Russ and Daughters. And working with her has been such a privilege and I have learned so much every second. Um, although the only problem is when I want to find an email she's written, it's impossible because I think we've exchanged about 70 emails per hour over the last few weeks. Um, but it's been wonderful to work with, with Jen. Um, and on the AJHS side, also Melanie Myers, our archivist, Tanya. Uh, Tanya Elder, who is actually organizing the Russ and Daughters collection and doing a beautiful job. And um, Chelsea Bracci, and who Chelsea has done everything, including <laughs> coming in on the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. We didn't have a counter for that. How many of you saw the counter that was out for the exhibit? It's amazing. And, and how many of you posed for a picture behind the counter? OK. So you were all able to do that because Chelsea Bracci, on Labor Day weekend, came in on a Sunday with a can of paint, found an old <laughs> uh, bookcase in the office, painted it, got some silver tape, and made it look amazing. And so she not only does things like that, she writes curriculum, and she makes sure we get filmed. When, when Emma Lazarus was in the news a few weeks ago because someone in the White House administration changed the words to the uh, Statue of Liberty, the new Colossus, to say, uh, give me your tired and your poor and those who can stand on their own two feet, we at AJHS thought, hmm, we have the original manuscript in our archive, and it is our responsibility to ensure that people know the real words and also know the context in which it was written and the spirit in which it was written. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and Chelsea uh, made, got us in the news everywhere, from the Huffington Post to the Washington Post to CNN, all because she called a friend at the Huffington Post and made it all happen. So this initiative is, is just so amazing. Um, so I want to thank all of the people that worked on this exhibit, and there are many more. I also want to welcome Reboot, who is here for a special fellowship, 10 cultural creatives from California, from New York, are here to do research in our archives under the guidance of uh, archivists and historians at AJHS and YIVO, Eddie Portnoy, Stephanie Halpern, Melanie Myers. Um, and, we're, and it's just also exciting to work with David Katznelson and Francine Hermelin on this project. And we're excited that this could dovetail together with all of this. Um, you all want to hear from a family called Russ. Um, and so it is uh, my great privilege to welcome tonight Hannah Goldfield, food critic from The New Yorker, um, who is going to interview two generations of Russ family. Um, Mark Russ Fetterman, third generation. Um, I also want to acknowledge Maria Fetterman, who is here in the audience tonight and was very important in this third generation. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we're going to hear also from uh, Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper, two cousins who have been leading Russ and Daughters over the last decade um, in this wonderful period of expansion. So I'm going to welcome everyone up. I'm going to come back at the end and give some more thoughts. Um, but I'm just so excited to welcome all of you, because this really does feel like it is family in this room. And I want to thank all of you for being part of this family. And uh, I hope you enjoy the exhibit. I hope you enjoy the discussion. At the end of the conversation, I'll come up and we're going to do some Q&A too. So think of your questions. One thing though, we know you have stories. 
Um, the stories, save your questions for the Q&A, and the stories, we want you to write down your stories that are gonna become part of our archive. So all the tables outside have cards for you to write your, your uh, food story. Okay, I'll be back, but please join me in welcoming Hannah, Nikki, Josh, and Mark. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I want to start by saying how honored I am to be doing this. Um, I am a critic, but like Annie, I'm, I'm not objective in this uh, scenario. I'm not just, tonight. Uh, not tonight. Exactly. I'm a huge fan of Russ and Daughters. Um, I think probably everyone in this room agrees that your family has brought great joy to so many people um, and has made me personally prouder than ever to be Jewish and to live in New York and just to, to feel like I'm part of this continuing tradition and legacy. Um, and so my first question is for all of you, but I think uh, particularly, or, or at least starting with Mark, which is, did you ever think as a child or even as a younger man that, that there would be an exhibit, a museum-like exhibit um, about your family's store? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's quite wonderful, and um, that was never in our vision. Um, we were a family, the Russ family was a family that was all about survival. So it's not like we were going to save memorabilia or, uh, or gather all of these uh, um, the stuff that we had used all these years. And so to wind, to, to sort of for me, it's winding up my career. This is a real capstone to find us, and an honor to find us here, exhibited and archived. I think the answer is probably a little bit different for you guys, because your generation has, you know, or in, in the time that you've been running the store, um, things have shifted a lot in terms of, of the store's legacy and place in the culture. Can you talk a little bit about that? and? how this is maybe less of a surprise since you've been working to kind of maintain the history? Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, I think we're the generation that has to straddle these two missions, which is preserving 105 years of tradition, but then also keeping it alive, keeping it relevant. And so that's what is always in the forefront of our of our minds um, in everything we've we've done, um, and so the exhibition, which I have to give huge kudos to Annie Pollan and everyone at HHS for for doing this, because frankly, when Annie came to us with the idea, I, I kind of poo pooed it, thinking like, archive, you know, we just we've just had our heads down, you know, right. slicing smoked salmon and uh, filleting whitefish. Um, you know, we never had took the mo the time to really think about what or actively preserve the legacy. We're we've really just been trying to keep it alive in the day to day uh, running of the store. Um, we we are here, Nikki and I, have sort of taken over in a time where, when I started 16 years ago, people started asking like, "Where's all the stuff right. from the history of the store?" And the answer was exactly what Mark said. It wasn't about the stuff. When something broke, a scale broke, or you know, a piece of equipment broke, or a register broke, we threw it away and got a new one. You know, there was no saving the things. But in our tenure, and I would imagine at the end of yours, there was this question of what about all this, you know, the history? And like, we have some photos from a 50th anniversary or uh, family photos, but. There wasn't a collection of things. Um, and since we've been getting asked for that stuff, we have started archiving and collecting and And, and finding, and th finding <clears throat> jewels. There was, you know, Annie said, just, just give me what you have. We'll come and we'll look right. through it. And so we had boxes. And um, Annie and Melanie uh, 
got, went through them and there was a cassette and so we don't, we don't know what's on this cassette, but here you go. <laughs> and turns out it was the audio that you can hear of um, Anne and Hattie, you know, the two surviving Rust daughters kibitzing um, like two golden girls and um, reminiscing and we didn't even know we had that. So it's been... How did that come to be recorded? What was that from? Like I th you know, uh, I was interviewing them and, and I was listening to it because of uh, the archive project and I don't really remember that happening. It was before the to, book. It was before the book, but it wasn't for the book. Yeah. I think it happened shortly after Ida, the middle daughter, passed away, mm -hmm. and I had a sense of urgency or importance that I get some of their story down. So I think that's how that happened. Um, one of the most interesting things, one of the things I found most interesting in, in, uh, about the exhibit was something I was talking to Annie about, which is that um, that Russ and daughters, I think it's the only it's the only end daughters, right? And as far the as first. we know, the first, first. The, right, the yeah. first, the first recorded um, and daughters uh, business uh, in the world in New York, in the country as in the far country, as we know. Probably, yeah. But HHS was able to confirm, at least that here, at least right. here in New York, the the record, and it's a very powerful thing, especially even in 2019. It's still totally such a rarity to see and daughters, and in you know 1935 when our great grandfather changed the name to think of just how bold a move that was. Um, and to see in the directory from 1935, you know, and sons and sons and, you know, and cousins and brothers. And then here's this one little shop. Right. It's Russ and daughters. It's shocking. And, and the other great thing in the exhibit um, that ties directly into that is that uh, Joel Russ, your grandfather, um, actually learned the business from his sister, um, whose name is Kana Eben, is that correct? Can you tell us a little bit more so, about that? Uh, his sister, his older sister, emigrated here before him by some years and married uh, Moses Eben. And Moses Eben was in the herring business, but the herring business in those days was a couple of old wooden barrels with Schmaltz Herring, and them, and is usually between two tenement, two tenement buildings, and the, and the Eastern Europeans, Jews or uh, non-Jews from Eastern Europe, would come down from the tenements and buy herring, and that would be the meal for the day. It was cheap. It was a nickel of herring, three for a dime, something like that. She, he, Moses, Eben. Um, was in this business and also was in the business of impregnating his wife. Ultimately gave her like <laughs> eight children and one day woke up with some kind of epiphany and decided that he was going to be a Talmudic scholar. Hmm. Had no time anymore for the herring, for the kids, and left his wife in charge of both. She in turn called to the other side to her younger brother. She had an older brother. Her younger brother, Joel, Yoel pronounced, um, and, and somebody here is going to ask, because I'm often asked, was Russ the name on the other side? That was the name. There are plenty of Russes in that area of Poland uh, that was once called Galicia. We are Galicianas, as opposed to Litvaks. Um, that's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. So, so she, she called for her help from her younger brother, Joel, and paid, you needed to pay a sponsorship fee in those days, which was $25, which sounds like not so much, but if you're selling herrings three for a dime, that's a lot of herring. She brought him over and put him uh, with a push cart that she rented for maybe 50 cents a day selling herring, these schmaltz herrings, until he paid her back, it took about three years. Uh, and he got married, it was an arranged marriage, and then he, like most of the Jews of the Lower East Side, took off to discover America. And as most Jews, he made it as far as Brooklyn. <laughs> and there he set up a candy store, which he had for about three years, and decided he missed the herring, the fish, the Lower East Side, came back and bought his, his first store. So, so that's the story of his sister. Um, just a little coda here is that uh, he subsequently needed help in the store, and he called for his older brother hmm. 
to come over and sponsored his older brother, whose name was Samuel Mendel in, in Yiddish, it's Shmuel Mendel, and the guy was known as Shma Mendel, <laughs> which I think is one of the great names of the world. If I should have another kid, it's Shma Mendel. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, he passed the business on to his daughter, so it ended up, there's just a real, I'm, I was just struck by the through line of women being involved in this business, and now, and now there's Nikki, um, yeah. who is, you, you know, you guys are, you do it together, but. Um, She's the real boss. <laughs> <laughs> but that must have been really inspiring for you as yeah. a young. And, and something that came out in the process of the, putting the exhibition together was um, Annie discovered that in the record, uh, Hannah Evan, who was listed as the housewife, and uh, her husband was listed as the herring, you know, business owner. And it's interesting that, you know, here we are, 2019, and we're trying to finally realize, seeing the ways and really appreciating the ways in which a lot of times women don't get to get credit for we've their also, work. We've also always <clears throat> joked that great grandpa Russ was a feminist. He probably wasn't, but <laughs> maybe he maybe he was. Yeah. Because his sister brought him over here and maybe there was some, you know, uh, recognition feeling of recognition of yeah, women are powerful and right. and bringing his daughters in there was I'm sure there was something back there. He was at least a default feminist. <laughs> But I remember my great aunt um, Hattie talking about, she remembered when he changed the name um, to Russ and Daughters and how uh, people would stop him to offer him you know, a piece of advice. And what, you know, Mr. Russ, why would you do this? Why would you ruin your good business <laughs> with that name? Um, it was very controversial. Mm. Um, so but the sad truth is if he had had a son, it probably would have been Russ and Sons. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about you talking about the price of the fish back when the when the business began, and, and I was noticing in the exhibit that um, the original name of the business had the word cut rate right. in it. Um, and so I, in thinking about just the whole history, it's been it's fascinating to me that the store has gone, and, and, and appetizing in general, has gone from being this, um, you know, real kind of cut rate immigrant fare, just, you know, pretty cheap stuff that you stretched um, to make many meals, to now, um, to what's kind of a luxury item now, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, can you guys all talk about that? I mean, that's a big question, but just the, I think it, it happened slowly, and then I think it kind of um, sped up maybe in the last, 20 years as food culture in New York um, just, you know, spun out of control or just got, got more intense? Well, I think the, it's still both of these. It's both of those things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you can walk into the store, you can walk into Russ and Daughters Cafe or Russ and Daughters of the Jewish Museum, and if you scan the room, you know, you'll see at one, you know, somebody sitting down and having a cup of coffee and some blintzes and then the next table over is having, you know, a huge platter of smoked fish and caviar and the champagne, and, and that's all happening at the same time. And um, yes, the you know prices have gone up, and I, but I think it's amazing that we still have customers who've been with us for 60, 70 years who can remember the prices. You know, they gave us a hard time. Like, oh, they, they let us know. Sable, <laughs> you know, I remember we called it chicken carp, and it cost, you know, 50 cents a pound, and, um, but, but the fact that there's that, that shared history that, and memory of um, the fact that this was at one point inex, you know, inexpensive sustenance um, and is now sort of prized food. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still the food that connects us to who we are and where we come from. Um, so it's still very much that taste the food of memory. There's, there's something special about it, right? And it's, I think, akin to like the Jewish ghettos of, of Paris or New York or, or Berlin being the cool spots to mm -hmm, live. Mm -hmm. So like, the, because it's, it's meaningful, like those locations. And this food is meaningful. So as 
prices keep going up and they will continue to go up, it's, it's meaningful enough to people that it, it's important to have this food in their lives. And luckily, a lot of our customers you know, went off and, and became successful and continue to come <laughs> back to the Lower back. East Side. <laughs> And babies are still being born, and you know the the sort of the life cycle is always you know in a continuum. And so the fact that this is the food that people want to eat to mark these moments in time, you know, is reassuring that hopefully we'll we can keep going with our customers across generations. Absolutely, and it's and it's a testament to how good the food is that it's that it's gone. Be I, I think um, Mark, you have a line about. It, it, uh, Rest and Daughters food being Jewish food that was sold to Jews in a Jewish neighborhood, and now in 2019, it's like who all Americans eat, eat bagels and lox. I was basically. in the cafe on Orchard Street last night, the night before, with some friends eating, and then I noticed at another table a guy looked. I, you know, I, this must be an old customer. I must say hello to him. Uh, I just can't remember his name, but I know I know him from the store. So I walk, I get up from the table, walk over to him, and say, "Hey, how are you?" The guy is looking at me. <laughs> I said, "Hey, you know, I just what's your name?" The guy has no idea. He starts speaking in a foreign tongue. So <laughs> he's from he's from Argentina. On the way out, there's a couple sitting there. I'm showing our friends the Rogues Gallery of photos, and this is my father with Zero Mostel, and this is my cousin and blah, blah, blah. And the woman sitting below the photo says, and who are you? I said, well, I'm Mark Russ. I'm the third generation of this business. I said, and where are you from? And I thought she said Colombia. My wife is from Colombia. I said, Colombia? My wife's from Colombia. And she said, no, Cambodia. Wow. <laughs> I said, wow. I said, you're from, are you living here? No. We're here on a visit. We heard about your place and we had to come. That's what happens to Russ and daughters. It's mm -hmm. true. We were once a Jewish store in a Jewish neighborhood selling Jewish food to Jewish customers. And now if you parse that, it's, it's just every part of that has changed. Yeah. I think it's very representative of, it, it's become at the very least New York food as, as kind of That's iconic right. mm -hmm. as pizza or, you know, what I guess people don't eat as many hot dogs anymore as they used to. But yeah, bagel and lox and pizza and it's... Right. It's, but even the humble herring has gone whole yes. cuisine, right? Yeah. It's, you see exactly. it on fancy menus, they dress it up. Yep. Usually they buy it from us, but they don't tell you that. <laughs> Put a pie on it. <laughs> um, and so you all um, started off, started your careers doing something else. Is that, that's correct, right? And so I'm wondering what, it, what, what do you think the through line is between the three of you that you all ended up kind of coming home to roost in the family business? And how did, and, and, and just and how did that happen? Well, um, so, for, so for me, coming into the business was irony, pure irony, because I wound up doing the very thing my family did not want me to do. They did not want me to sell fish on the Lower East Side. It was, when they ran the business, my parents, aunts and uncles and grandparents, there was nothing romantic about selling fish on the Lower East Side. So the concept was for me and my siblings and cousins, the third generation of Russes, to get an education because they didn't have an education. Most of them hadn't finished high school. It was just survival, right? So they couldn't get it. So it was important for them that we got an education, we did. Uh, and then in their ultimate fantasy, which may be a Jewish fantasy, but I think it's any immigrant group, is that one or more of us would become a professional a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant, a teacher. Uh, and, that, and of the seven Russ grandchildren, my level, only one actually lived out that ultimate fantasy, and that was me. I was a little nerdier. I went to law school. I practiced law. And then after eight years of doing that, I came back to take over the business because my father, who was sick, was getting sicker. My mother wasn't going to run the business. And so they were talking about there wasn't a market for, uh, for buying an appetizing store in the Lower East Side in those days. We're talking about 1970s. New York was going down the tubes, and the Lower East Side was leading the way, right? So, um, so I was with a fancy firm practicing law, and, 
And so I decided I would give that up. Or actually, I decided I would practice law on my own, leave the firm. I wasn't particularly fond of the firm, law firm life. I would practice law on my own half time and run Russ and Daughters the other half time. But the first day I came in there was the last day I practiced law. <laughs> looking back, <laughs> looking back, it worked out well for me because there's practicing law, there may be lawyers, I know there are lawyers in here, so <laughs> forgive me. It's not, it's not a profession that really soothes the soul. Mm. Selling fish <laughs> and herring <laughs> were making them happy. Um, and so I grew up a shop kid. I grew up watching my parents work, hanging out in the shop uh, while they finished up at the end of the day, running over to Katz's to get a hot dog when I got bored, um, waiting at the door. Uh, I think I was five or six, like one of my earliest memories of the store is waiting at the door for the <laughs> produce delivery guys to come with their 50-pound sacks of onions and carrots and potatoes, and I would jump up on the sacks and sit on top of their hand carts, and I would direct them to the kitchen and you all know the store, so you know there's just one little, you know, way uh, through the store. But I, you know, I felt like without me, they were surely gonna get lost. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up, and then as I got older, I would, you know, my father would put me to you know, pick up the phone and, you know, hand out, you know, this, fill up this bag with uh, coffee nibs, or you know, give me little odd jobs. Um, but I think I was impacted by watching my parents interact with all of you. I, I didn't understand. I understood there was something magical there, but I also thought that that was the norm. I didn't realize that it's, you know, you don't go into Dwayne Reed and start <laughs> hugging and kissing, <laughs> you know, the person at the counter, and you don't <laughs> swap stories about your, you know, your children. Um, but that's what I thought was how, what happens when you go to buy your food. Um, but I was educated to do anything but to, you know, be a fishmonger. And it took me about seven years. I think consider that like my, you know, the wandering Jew phase <laughs> um, of sort of doing, trying on the different jobs and professions that I thought that I was supposed to do. You know, having attained a certain level of education and worldliness that um, that those were supposed to be the sort of you know, um, acceptable paths. And there was always this, I was always left with the feeling of sort of, of emptiness or just <clears throat> nothing felt real to me. Um, and it took me sort of getting to the bottom of the list um, to then really, you know, not really having another option, but also starting to think about what does this place called Ross and Daughters actually mean to me? And I realized that everywhere I went, you know, I moved out to California right after college thinking like, how far away can I get, you know, but still stay in the same country and go to California and the literally the first time there, uh, the person I was staying with wanted to, drove me out to an empty storefront. I thought I was just going to go help her run, you know, go to the supermarket. Turns out she had other ideas in mind. She drove me to this storefront and said, so this is where I think you should open Russ and Daughters West. <laughs> yeah, I looked into the rent, like she had it all planned out. Um, but any, everywhere I went, people, they hear Russ and Daughters and they would light up and they would tell me a story. And I, after you know, a while I realized this, there's something there and I don't have to look at the, this yichis, this, this legacy. I, uh, as something that at one point felt like a burden to me or an expectation, I could actually shift it around in my mind and see it as this amazing gift mm. to preserve something not just for our family but for, you know, for all for all of you, and that it didn't have to be um, that as as beautiful and special as our shop is. That it also didn't have to be stuck in time. Mm. And it could, it could grow. It could, you know, continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. So, I came back. I I grew up a hippie. <laughs> um, 
and then rebelled and became an engineer um, <laughs> and worked on the West Coast for a while until I heard through the grapevine, I think my mother or my aunt or someone, that Mark was looking for his exit strategy. And at the same time, I, was, I think I was 26, I was working as an engineer in semiconductors. I couldn't ever explain what I did to anyone. <laughs> I mean, I, I explained it like hundreds and hundreds of times, but every time I saw my family, they'd be like, what do you do again? <laughs> which is an indicator of I was doing something that may not be touching people's lives so much. Um, certainly didn't have a, a, a personal interaction with the people that were using computers. Or, uh, so I was sort of questioning what I was doing and where I came from. Started thinking about my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, Mark's mother, um, and what she did with her life. She was a real matriarch, a, a power figure in, in our family. And what she did with her life was wrestling daughters. Um, so when I heard Mark was, was looking for an exit strategy, which was Nikki at that moment, there was mm -hmm. an interesting story. We won't fully get into it. I'm going to keep it brief. Um, I started saying, hey, look, I'll leave my career and, and get into the business. And over the course of four months, from my perspective, I convinced him. Um, from his perspective, Nikki finally, at, at the end, was like, all right, I'm going to do my own thing. And he was like, oh, shit. Like, I guess, excuse me. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's how we I talk guess, on the other side I of the guess, We're all adults I here. I guess I'll let Josh come, come to New York and see what happens. Um, so I, I came in 16 years ago, and, and it was great. And back to the through line of every one of our stories, there's all different paths. But it's really maybe not a moment of searching in our lives, but there's this moment of what's important. Mm -hmm. What's important to society? What's important to us? What's important to our family? What's important to New York? And Rust and Daughters is important. Mm -hmm. I think that drew us all back. Mm -hmm. um, the passion for the business and the passion for uh, what we can, what we share with people and, and how we provide this service and delicious food to people. Right. Um, so it's interesting to think that if you guys hadn't decided that you wanted to be a part of the business, and if Mark before you hadn't decided that he wanted to be a part of the business, Russ and Daughters might not exist. And there, that's also something that's, um, there's a little piece in the exhibit about how your father uh, had a kind of hard decision to make at one point pretty early in the uh, history of the story, I think, where he ran out of money and he had to choose between his house. Grandpa. I'm sorry, your grandfather. Yeah, sorry, right. your grandfather. Um, he had to choose between his house and the store, right? Um, and he chose the store. Yes. And if he hadn't chosen the store, none of us would, would we certainly wouldn't be on this stage right, right. now. And your, the course of your family's history. Right. Was, it looks it, like the right idea yeah. from this perspective. Right. But if you were to ask my mother and aunts at that time, they were young women, or my grandmother at that time, uh, they were not pleased with that decision at mm -hmm. all. They were happy in Brooklyn. They weren't happy with smelling like a fish and the <laughs> fish business. And, and my grandmother, Bella, um, she, having to move back from the house, the big house in Flatbush, to the rat-infested tenements of Lower East Side, broke her spirit mm. for all time. She never recovered mm. from that. She had not made peace as an immigrant with America, because she went from, from Galicia to the Lower East Side, Lower East Side was even though there's this romantic notion of it, it was an awful place to live. She was not happy there at all. Finally, he got his family, Joel got his family to Flatbush. She had a big house, it was two families, so they rented half of it and could afford it. She had a big yard to grow her vegetables and her flowers. She finally made peace with America and was happy and then had to move back to the Lower East Side. So yes, it was the right decision now looking back. Right but maybe not then to them. Right. Are there other examples of, of kind of sliding doors moments in the store's history where you almost did or didn't do something that proved to be kind of the saving grace? Or well, I can tell you this. Um, the, the Lower East Side, when I came in the 1970s, the Lower East Side, as I suggested, was going downhill. It was in a downward spiral, and people would say to me, Mark, why don't you move your business uptown where your customers are? And I glibly said, Uptown, sooner or later, uptown will move downtown. 
So, in fact, that happened. I looked ra rather smart. Um, I was not prescient. I just, you know, we owned the building, so we stayed there. So the decision to not move turns out to have been the right decision. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we almost mistakenly moved, not the store, um, but when Josh and I set about to open the restaurant, um, we thought, well, you know, after 100 years, maybe Russ and Daughters should be, you know, in another part of town. Um, it seemed logical to us, and we started to look at spaces. Um, we also didn't know what we were doing. We didn't, we didn't know how to open or run a restaurant um, either. But uh, that seemed like a good idea, and we actually got really close. Um, we were found a space in Chelsea that we thought was great. And um, we were planning to open a restaurant, bakery, and retail. For retail and production way, space. Way beyond. It would have, yeah. That was, there were so many bad ideas. But yeah. we, we were forging ahead. And um, it was the night before we were supposed to sign the lease. And I remember starting to talk to my husband um, about it. And just really, it just all started to feel so wrong. And at that moment, Josh called me up and said, this really does not feel right. Hmm. And what it crystallized for us was that our, so much of our history and, um, is tied up with the Lower East Side. And the restaurant, to give people a place after 100 years of everyone standing up, to finally give people a place to sit down, that needed to happen in our neighborhood. Um, and so we put the kibosh on the Chelsea idea, thankfully, and kind of from there, things came together very quickly because we had this sort of laser focus. Mm -hmm. um, originally, we thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if the restaurant is right next to the store? Um, we, the, the rent is still too damn high uh, <laughs> <laughs> on both sides. But um, uh, we found the space where I hope most of you have come, and, and that restaurant, the landlord is a customer. Our biggest negotiation with him was he wanted to make sure that he could always get his high holiday order, <laughs> that we would save a spot for him. <laughs> yes, done, we can do that. Um, and, uh, and I love the fact that there actually is a sort of two block walk between the store and the restaurant because it, it roots you in the neighborhood, you can still look up, and there's still a few, you know, tenement buildings still left. Um, and to, to, for many people who come back to the Lower East Side, it's like, they're, you know, that so many of us can trace our family roots back to this one neighborhood, and people rely on us to be able to be a place that's still there for them. And um, so I'm glad that we didn't mess that one up. Mm -hmm. And then there's a story, I don't, I don't know, I haven't told Nikki about this a few years ago. I was playing in a card game, a high stakes card game. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so Mark, I know you've said that when you, when you took over the store, it was, it was kind of a, it felt more about just kind of immediate survival, like how, how do you keep this thing running? Um, and I think for you guys, it was maybe, a, or maybe this was true for you at the time too, but it, for you guys, for sure, it seems to be how do you take this this very old-fashioned thing and keep it current? And I think you 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 got lucky in some ways. As, as I said, I think that food culture just became so much more prominent in culture in general. But I think also you've done an amazing job of riding that wave. Can you can you talk about how you've approached that? And maybe and Mark too, if you if you did similar things when you were um, taking over in the 70s. So as Nikki said, there's always that tension. What do you need to keep? What do you need to change? Um, and, and that's a constant conflict because then you're dealing with a legacy, a heritage business, and there's a real built-in fear if you change something, the whole thing will fall apart. And besides that inherent fear, you have actually customers telling you, <laughs> you can't do it that way. If I decided to move the schmaltz herring to the back from the front and the machis herring in front, there's no doubt there'd be a lineup of um, my Jewish, older Jewish customers saying, what'd you do that for? Your parents didn't do it that way. Your grandparents did. So 
So that, that was always a problem. But it was clear to me that you had to change some things. Um, first of all, some items disappeared. You know, they were overfished or um, disappeared or ch taste change. Um, so there were some things you had to change and some things you had to change just for the convenience of doing business, upscale it a little bit. Um, so there was always that constant tension and it, I came down on the side of, you know what, we can't just be a museum. Because if we're a museum, keeping everything the same all the time, people will come, they'll be happy, they'll see it, they'll say, that's wonderful, but they won't come back again. Right. So it was organic changes, you know, always with resistance. So if I brought in tofu cream cheese, not just regular, <laughs> but everybody's asking, and I brought it in, certainly, so what is that? You know, that kind of thing. Right. To, to, to speak to, to Mark's tenure, I, I think him and his wife were running a store at a time when, I mean, the 70s were rough, and it was a nasty place down there. And they really, they did a big renovation, for one, and they really made it, uh, like, sparkle, mm. I guess. Right. And which is, was a, a big change. Like, it was, I was going to say dumpy, but it was like an old family store. And to both of them, like, you walk in there and everything is spotless. Everything is perfectly in its place. He trained us to do that um, as well. But this idea of uh, fear and aversion to change um, is core and, and very important to, to what we're doing as we grow because we can't lose sight of, of the connectedness that the store has to its history and the family and, and who we really are. And I, I'm, I'm just like thinking this, maybe it's been dumbed down enough where we're, <laughs> we're able to do something crazy like open an 18,000 square foot facility in mm -hmm. Brooklyn, <laughs> but at the same time, stay connected to our history and, and the roots of, of who we are. I think because, you know, herring and smoked fish and bagels has been, as you said, the sort of survival mechanism in the store, was, you know, our family's survival. We've been doing this trade um, for so long, uh, way before anyone thought that, um, uh, way before there was a, the food kind of, or sort of celebrity food culture that we have now, mm -hmm. um, long before people talked about what was trendy or not trendy, um, uh, it's just been what we've done. And it, it, it's taught us, I think we came into the business um, knowing the hard work, um, that, that it is, and um, not doing it for any kind of glamour. Um, and what that has meant is also that the things we have done, it's really born out of a, uh, the objective of how do you keep Russ and Daughters alive for another 105 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't sort of map out a whole like 10 year you know, vision. Um, the cafe was born out of you know, a few too many calls every single day from people wondering um, if they could get a table for four at 12 o'clock. Um, or people coming in the store and trying to walk into the kitchen yeah. to sit down. Right? Like our, <laughs> our, um, um, so that's, we felt like we, we should just, we should open a restaurant. We'll f figure out how to do that. Um, we started we, our own bakery because, I mean, that bakery, uh, having a bakery is a very bad idea from a business perspective, <laughs> but we felt like what we all cherish as a, these sort of icon, our prized Jewish foods, bagels, bialis, rye bread, pumpernickel, th these things were dying or getting sort of bastardized and we felt a need to preserve them. And so we said, well, we had to figure out how to become bakers. Um, so, so I think that we've been propelled by sort of these, an uh, aspiration, um, 
or maybe a, a leap of faith, which is that if we do these things, maybe there'll be another generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you're all savvy business people. I mean, you all, you seem to have a touch for doing that just the way you've, you've just seemed like naturals at social media and kind of, and especially the aesthetics of the store, I've been really impressed by you, just all the little things. You'd think that, but <laughs> like, like we've, we've said before, and even in, in all of us, you know, you're, you're, it's an organic development, mm -hmm. right? And when we sat down to talk about the restaurant and design the restaurant, it's just like debating every possible design mm -hmm. decision, mm -hmm. menu decision, and, and going back to like this, we sh well, if we're going to do this, we better not screw it up. You know, like being right. afraid to mess up what we do and what we know, and keeping it simple. Right. And this, it's constant debate. This store, you know, that little shop on East Towson Street is, is our sort of, you know, um, inspiration and reference point. So I, I would be a total failure at opening a Italian restaurant or you know uh -huh. uh, anything other than this because it, in a way a like we Russell don't <laughs> we don't look outside of ourselves. Um, there's sort of a natural, I think, healthy tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. of just we know what we know, and and Russ and Dar's Cafe was we were always looking to the store. You know, how do we just sort of how do you bring 105 years of that shop to a totally new space and give people a, a way to enjoy it in a sit-down atmosphere. But we we're always going back to the store and, and you know, Russell Daughters at the Jewish Museum, same thing, you know, the Navy Yard now. Um, and the best compliment we can get is when somebody walks into those other places and says, you know, ah, oh, it feels like the store. But it's not the store. Right. And we don't want to try to replicate right. that, which is singular. I think we're probably nearing the question and answer portion of the of the night. I have just one more question though, which is, do you are you guys thinking at all about the next generation already? And are there are there children in your family who you're hoping will will take over? So I have uh, an eight year old and a three year old. <laughs> um, I would like to think that I'm you know sort of a progressive enlightened parent that my children can do whatever they want to do with their lives. But really, um, I mean, I do harbor a, a hope that I have somebody a, in the family will I want to I have a theory. It, all kids want to rebel. So if we refuse to let them get involved in the business. <laughs> then they'll, they'll come running they back. <laughs> yeah. My daughter, Maya, she's now eight. But when she was, I think, four, out of the blue one day, she said, Mommy, when I grew up, I want to work with you at the oh. store. And I literally scanned the room, and I was looking for a crayon or something where I could just take her hand and make her sign <laughs> the paper. That'll, that'll um, hold up. And of course, like a week later, she, you know, that idea Forgot. was out the window, and right. she wanted to make jewelry. Um, so, but they, um, I, I think for me personally, growing up in the shop was such a seminal. Um, education, mm -hmm. uh, not just to be able to do the work that we do now, but the, the way that it's put me in contact with humanity. Did it, made you, did it make you want to be in the business or not be in the business? <laughs> what, growing, growing up in the yeah. show? I mean, here I am, right? So, uh, I, and. a politician. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it was, I think it, it's a, it's, it holds some magic, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. So we'll we'll see, we'll see. But hopefully, you'll see my kids. You know, during the holidays, I'll start to do the same thing that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And you know, they might be handing out your orders oh, in a few years. Actually, if you listen to the audio um, and the, I think some of the sections where Mark and Maria are being interviewed, you can hear Elon, fourth generation, in the background um, because he was playing in the background. So, uh, fifth, fifth gen, yeah, fifth generation. Yeah. yeah so. um, I think if you have questions, um, please raise your hand. We're only going to take a few just because of the hour and because there's people waiting to serve you dessert. I see someone whose hand is literally propelling her almost up into the ceiling. <laughs> Um, this is not a question, but I remember one <laughs> holiday 
when there was a line outside of Russ and Daughters that encircled the block. And suddenly, an accordion player was playing klezmer music. <laughs> People were dancing. We didn't care if we had to wait five hours or six hours. And I remember it said to Mark, that was a great idea. He said, that wasn't my idea. <laughs> it was Nikki's idea. And then I remember when you had the herring tasting, I said, Mark, that's a great idea. <laughs> he said, I said to her, who's going to eat herring and <laughs> vodka? So Mark, you have gone along on this new road, and you're very instrumental. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Elaine. That, first of all, Robin and Elaine, if you come to the cafe, you will inevitably see them at their spots, the first and second seats at the bar. Um, it's funny, that, the, that klezmer music was, um, I got it into my head one day that, you know, for Air of Yom Kippur, as you have probably all done, you know, people wait in line for their breakfast food. The, the line can, you know, people can wait hours. And um, I thought, let's have, like, let's make this, you know, kind of a happy affair. Um, and we had, um, so I got these klezmer musicians to come. And this is that sort of generational tension because my father, Nikki, it's era of Yom Kippur. <laughs> it's a solemn day. This is not a festive thing. You can't do this. This is going to offend people. Um, and I uh, just, we did, just anyway. we just did it anyway. <laughs> and Alina Sheffy, one of our longtime counter people, um, whose picture is up on the in the exhibition, um, she it was her birthday. She's you know, was born in Romania, uh, moved to Israel, grew up speaking Yiddish, and I put her on the spot. And at one point, you know, people were waiting in line, they were waiting for hours, it's loud, and, and I stopped everything in the store, and I made her get up on a, a pickle barrel <laughs> and sing, I forget the, the song, but the song in Yiddish. Um, and uh, it was great that, yeah, nobody revolted. I don't think I offended anyone, and I heard, you know, years later, people saying, like, I was there that day when you played klezmer. <laughs> the only problem was the klezmer music, music was so loud that then when people went back to placing their orders over the counter, you, nobody could hear anything. <laughs> so. Perfect. I have a question all the way here in the back. <laughs> Your schissel rye. It, it's, it's part of my DNA. It, it's a taste of the, of the shtetl. How do you get your schissel rye? How do you make your How do we make it? We can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but this was born of the Jewish corn rye through a baker we found in Massachusetts um, that was making basically a, a kind of traditional corn rye. Right. It was a corn but rye. But we, we learned of him through a customer who um, would tell me about this shisel rye he had, and it was the rye of his youth. And um, he came in one day, and he brought a loaf of it. And I ate it, and even though I was in my 30s at the time, I felt like I was transported back to the shtetl. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was that taste memory. Um, and when we decided to start you know, our own bakery, that was, you know, we felt like today, what people think of as rye bread today is deli rye. That's not, that's not a, tr a real, a traditional rye bread. Um, and so we got to work and thought, how do we, you know, how do we start making this rye bread? And a part of it is that the, um, the seeds, the charnuska seed and the rye, the caraway is, is enveloped in the dough. So it's not just, you know, sitting on top, but that part of that flavor is, um, is that it's right there in the, in the dough. So I'll tell you that that same customer, when he passed away, his uh, wife uh, came to us and said, um, you know, we, I, I, she said, I, I can't. I, I just am not in any state right now to, to have a shiva in my home. Russ and Daughters is, feels like our living room. Do you mind if we have the shiva here? Wow. So... We did. 
I have one more question here. Uh, realizing that uh, quality control is so critical, at what point after the salmon is caught does Russ and Daughters get involved or does Russ and Daughters do its own fishing? Hmm. <laughs> I wish. Oh. Once a year, we'll yeah. go out for striped bass. <laughs> um, so we've worked with, so there's actually an old law on the books, it's still there to this day, that um, prohibits the commercial smoking of fish in Manhattan. It's like a turn of the century pollution law that's still around, um, which is why you don't see smokehouses in Manhattan. Um, so our family has always kind of given out, given our specs to a, a constellation of, of smokers who have smoked for us, and it's always been this kind of, my father writes about it so well in the book about this kind of tension, fight um, to get what is, you know, is our smoked fish, and we reject about 30% of it. I think it was much more belligerent in your days, and it's a little <laughs> bit more civil now. But um, uh, I think part of why we have the quality that we do is that we've um, always stayed independent, and we're always sort of gauging on a daily basis how the fish are running, and we make adjustments um, uh, literally every single day to, to keep the flavor profiles and the fattiness and you know the way it should be because that's that's for us that's really the objective right that you should taste a piece of a slice of Gaspe Nova and it needs to taste the same way that you remembered it 40 years ago so that's a that's a constant you know dance that we do anyone else If you have stories that relate to Russ and Daughters and that you have your own food stories that are important, we want to collect those for our own archive. Um, so we ask that whether tonight or throughout the duration of the exhibit, there are cards there for you to write your stories. We'll add those stories to our Russ and Daughters collection here. If you know of other Jewish food businesses that have archives, <laughs> we'll take them also, let us know. Um, and I also want to let you know, if you again, if you like this, there are so many wonderful stories that are in the exhibit that have come from this. And one of the, the parts that I loved the most of this was that cassette tape that Mark interviewed Hattie and Anne in January of 2002. Wonderful stories, and um, with the help of Gemma Solomons here, we were able to create clips, and those clips are available on our website, they're available in the exhibit. Every time you see a little bagel icon, it's an indication that you can hear a story. Tonight, with all the party, it's the hardest, it's not easy to hear. But in those clips, you can hear stories, and you hear stories of in the early generations of when there was no choice but to work at the store. And then you hear more in the later generations about what it meant to have choice. But I think one of the things that's so important is that the third and the fourth generation, or Nikki, Josh, and Mark, and Maria, understood that the choices they were making could only be those choices and would only work so well if they understood that the people before them didn't have choices necessarily and that they preserved that history. Um, so even as they adapted the store, they preserved history in a way that would not exist had it not been for this store. Um, and so we're, we're grateful for that here at AJHS and we're excited to have this opportunity to showcase these stories and, and to collect your stories as well. One last thing is if you like this story, <laughs> there's more. Our gala that honors, is it's named in honor of, of Emma Lazarus this year. We'll be honoring the Russ family on December 3rd. Um, we'll be launching our new exhibit. So this exhibit will still be up, Russ and Daughters, but in addition, we have an exhibit funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities about Emma Lazarus that will be up at the same time. So um, if you could see the icon, it's a Statue of Liberty, oops. There it is, whatever, holding up a bagel. <laughs> and, and, and to bring it together, and there will be Russ and Daughters food at that gala, um, and it will be supporting the work that we do here at the Society, because if you think that these stories are, you want this, we want Russ and Daughters to exist, we want Maya and Ilan to continue 
uh, this tradition, but I think what's, mo what's also important is that the stories behind it, the stories of immigrant founders, the stories of the next generation and the next generation after that, the story of movement out of the Lower East Side, um, movement into professions and, and all sorts of stuff, that's preserved because a historical society exists and, and does it. So we hope that you can come and help support that work and celebrate with us. Lori Anderson, who's a wonderful customer, of uh, Ross and Daughters, a beloved customer at Ross and Daughters, um, will be uh, reading the new Colossus, Emma Lazarus's poem. So in addition to this icon that we've created of the Statue of Liberty with a bagel, we'll be bringing these two iconic New York stories um, together. Both Emma Lazarus and the Russ family understand the importance of story in, in various ways and are so important for New York. So again, one last people, what group of people I need to thank are um, my husband, Mike, and my daughter, Lily Smirnick, who allowed me to take Russ and Daughters with me on our vacation to Block Island so I could finish <laughs> writing it and working on it. But I, they had to hear me talk about Russ and Daughters on an island where we could not access, access <laughs> Russ and Daughters. Um, so uh, right outside uh, tonight, we have a wonderful Russ and Daughters sponsored dessert. Um, I want to thank Hannah for doing such a wonderful job interviewing. <laughs> I also want to thank my adopted family, the Russ. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming, and please um, enjoy uh, dessert with us outside.